FTP standards and recommended practices 2016. At the end of the webinar, the participant will be able to understand the process of developing inadvertent perioperative hypothermia, which is also known as IPH, but I shan't refer to it as that very much. Demonstrate knowledge of the NICE Clinical Guideline 65 recommendations. Be specifically knowledgeable about techniques to use in operating theatres to keep adult patients warm and to identify technologies which may assist to maintain patients' normothermia. When a patient's core body temperature drops, they're said to have inadvertent hypothermia. It may be as little as half a degree, but will still have a considerable potential impact on their clinical outcome. What is the temperature that is defined as mild inadvertent hypothermia. It's 36 degrees. It is thought that at least half of all patients undergoing surgery develop a core temperature of less than 36 degrees Celsius and one third of all patients drop their temperature to below 35 degrees. In order to get a full picture of the impact on patients during their surgical journey, we need to understand a few extrinsic facts about the environment and also some intrinsic factors about the patient. Is there anything about the environment that contributes to the increased risk of hypothermia which we can have an impact on? Well, if the surgical environment is cold, then this will not assist the patient. And it's suggested by NICE that we warm the operating room temperature to receive the patient and then reduce the temperature once their warming process has begun so that the team is then comfortable. NICE recommend a minimum theatre temperature of 21 degrees C whilst the patient is being prepped and is exposed. Theatre hum humidity does not appear to be relevant. If cold irrigation fluid is given, heat is taken from the patient into the fluid. This also affects blood, so any blood or fluids and ir any irrigation fluids given to the patient should be warmed. We'll come back to this aspect later. Patients who are aged more than 70 years and neonates are said to be at particular risk. Elderly patients are more likely to have pre-existing conditions which reduces their peripheral blood flow such as vascular disease and diabetes. The higher risk relates to older patients having general or regional anesthesia and has been found to be due to the fact that they lose heat more quickly than younger adults due to decreased fat or muscle mass and changes in vascular tone that inhibits vasoconstriction and decreases heat production. Neonates and infants are more susceptible to hypothermia than adults because they have a high ratio of skin surface area to weight, which leads to greater heat loss through their skin. During major surgery, their heat loss increases, particularly during open cavity procedures. When adults have open surgery, they too lose more heat to the environment. General anesthesia will come on to in greater detail, but it is a significant factor. Patients who suffer burns or trauma, especially if they've been rescued from a road traffic accident where they may have been waiting in the field and exposed to the weather for several hours, are likely to become hypothermic. The figures suggest 20 to 50% of all trauma patients become hypothermic, and in one major study, more than half of all trauma patients who have become hypothermic died. General anesthesia is the cause of a redistribution of body heat from the core to the periphery. So during induction of anesthesia, there is a vasodilation, which redistributes the heat from the core to the outer tissues, and that consequently causes a drop in the core temperature. It could be said to be like throwing open all the windows in a heated and comfortable building, losing all the internal heat straight to the outside. How quickly does this reduction of heat occur when anesthesia is first induced? As you can see from the graph, remarkably quickly. Within 45 minutes of induction, the patient may have lost as much as 1 degree Celsius in that first 35 to 40 minutes, 
and up to 1.6 degrees in the first hour. This temperature drop happens as soon as anesthesia is administered. The length of the procedure doesn't always correlate with time the patient is under general anesthesia. Even short cases can, reduce an, uh, can require anesthesia long enough for patient temperature to drop significantly. As you know, the process of getting the patient settled on the table, prepped, draped in the correct position, and all the other preamble to surgery actually starting with the incision can be at least 20 minutes. For patients undergoing complex surgery or with many comorbidities, anesthesia time may be as much as an hour prior to the first incision. After the first hour of anesthesia, there continues to be a decrease in body temperature when metabolically the patient cannot create more heat than they lose. However, if effective patient warming is in place, then this can reduce the effect and can limit further heat loss. After approximately three to five hours of anesthesia, the patient core temperature often plateaus and is characterized by a core body temperature that remains constant, even during prolonged surgery. It may be helpful to review some of the basic physics at work here. Heat loss is caused by a variety of different mechanisms. During surgery, all or some of the means are at work some or all of the time, contributing to the patient's overall heat loss to the environment. So radiation is when heat is lost by the transfer of energy in the form of waves or rays, i.e. we radiate heat when we're hot. This is the major means by which we lose heat during surgery. Convection occurs also and is the second most common form of heat loss during surgery whereby heat is transferred between an object and its environment by movement within a liquid, in this case blood. Conduction occurs moving or transferring heat between two objects which are touching, such as the patient and the operating table mattress. And evaporation also plays a part, which may be when skin prep is undertaken and the fluid evaporates into the environment and the skin cools as a result of the process. The consequences of inadvertent hypothermia in patients are considerable, both psychological and physiological. Firstly, the cold has an impact on the patient's coagulation system. This works through three systems. One is platelet function, also the coagulation cascade, and fibrinolysis. Platelet numbers remain normal during mild hypothermia, but their function is impaired. In the coagulation cascade, enzyme function is slowed by hypothermia. Studies suggest that fibrinolysis is enhanced by hypothermia, impairing clot formation. A meta-analysis of RCTs and studies looking at the effect of hypothermia on the need for blood transfusions indicated that even mild hypothermia significantly increases blood loss by approximately 16% and increases the risk of needing a transfusion by approximately 22%. Two thermoregulatory effects have been shown to occur which affect the cardiovascular system and which may have serious consequences. The first is the vasoconstriction, which increases arterial blood pressure, which may in turn lead to atrial fibrillation. The second is shivering, which increases metabolic demands and potentially hypoxemia and myocardial ischemia. Surgical patients with cardiac disease and who are hypothermic are three times more likely to have an adverse myocardial outcome. Hypothermia elevates blood pressure, heart rate, and plasma catecholamine. There is an increased oxygen binding to hemoglobin, which in turn reduces available oxygen for tissues. Drug metabolism is affected by even mild hypothermia and increases the duration of muscle relaxant action. Epidural and spinal anesthesia decrease the threshold for thermoregulatory responses of vasoconstriction and shivering. Regional anesthesia decreases the threshold 
triggering vasoconstriction and shivering above the level of the block. In addition, regional anesthesia is frequently supplemented with sedatives and analgesics, which adds to the thermoregulatory response. The vasoconstriction impact may also have some effect on surgical site infections due to lower blood flow and therefore oxygen supply to the tissues. An RCT demonstrated that patients with a drop of average core temperature of approximately 2 degrees C were three times more likely to develop surgical site infections. The same study showed that the length of stay in hypothermic patients increased by 20% over normothermic patients. The NICE guideline defines the perioperative journey for patients as from one hour prior to induction of anesthesia to 24 hours after the patient goes into recovery. We will examine this guidance in more detail now. The guideline specifies that it relates specifically to adult surgical patients and not to children or neonates. The NICE clinical guideline identifies the preoperative period as a key assessment phase to identify whether the patient is at particular risk of inadvertent perioperative hypothermia, and all members of the team are involved in this process. The key assessment criteria will identify if a patient is at higher risk if they have two or more of the following. They are ASA two, between 2 and 5. They have a preoperative temperature of 36 degrees or less are to go undergo regional and general anesthesia, have major or intermediate surgery, and they are already identified as at risk of cardiovascular complications. So on admission, the guideline advises that patients are at higher risk who may have two or more of those factors on the previous slide, and that in the admission phase, ward staff should be identifying those at more significant risk. The means of assessment are more than just to ask the patient if they feel comfortably warm. Some monitoring is also required, and if necessary, active warming by a variety of mechanisms may be started. Patients will need to be advised as part of their pre-admission information to bring warm clothing to hospital with them. Wards are often colder than a patient's home and extra bedding may not be available. Ward staff need to be educated to make an observation preoperatively of a patient's overall ability to keep themselves warm. Patients who are able to walk to theatre may, by using this energy, maintain their body temperature a little longer, although those less mobile will need to be assisted to stay warm on the often drafty hospital corridors. If pre-medication is prescribed, especially benzodiapines, tramadol, midazolam, or opioids, ward staff will need to be particularly observant pre-surgery. A baseline temperature reading should be taken before the patient leaves the ward. Once the patient arrives in theatre, staff will observe and monitor their temperature to use as a theatre baseline for future measurements. NICE advises that if the patient's temperature at this time is 36 degrees or less, then induction of anesthesia should not begin until the patient is warmer, unless it is necessary to expedite surgery. And um, a piece of um, research that's been done since um, the NICE guideline was published has identified that um, the patient should be warmed, ideally, for between 10 and 20 minutes, so it has been suggested that 15 minutes is appropriate. Um, they should be pre-warmed in the anesthetic room and that that helps to prevent um, any hypothermia in theatre. So pre-warming for 15 minutes. Prevention mechanisms to, to put in place at this time are also raising the temperature of the operating theatre consider pre-warming, which is what I've just talked about. Uh, active patient warming suggests 
starting to use forced air warming in the anaesthetic room. And guidance um, added after the initial publication of Clinical Guideline 65 suggested that endotherm heated mattresses are also a useful means of effective patient warming. Warming IV fluids and irrigation fluids should also be part of the prevention techniques in use by the multidisciplinary theatre team. And we'll come back to this topic in further detail later. We've already covered most of the elements on this slide recommended by the NICE guidelines in one way or another. However, measurement of the patient's core temperature can be by a variety of means. Those identified by ARN as the four most reliable sites for core temperature measurement are the tympanic membrane, the distal esophagus, the nasopharynx, and the pulmonary artery. The tympanic membrane is a common non-invasive place to measure core temperature. Pre- and post-operatively, it's the most frequently used area. The carotid area artery flows close to the tympanic membrane, which supplies the thermoregulatory center in the hypothalamus. In theater, the most regular site for measuring core temperature is the esophagus, using a probe. It's said to be a very accurate core temperature reading, but would not be used for any other than intermediate or major surgery. The nasopharynx is also a reliable site for intraoperative temperature measurement, although these may be affected by the temperature of inspired gases and may be as much as half a degree lower than core temperature. The most invasive means of core temperature measurement is in the pulmonary artery, which is a costly option both in time to site the catheter and also the cost of the actual device itself. The NICE guidance specifies that if the patient's temperature is only 36 degrees C in the anaesthetic room, not only should it be recorded as a critical incident, but that induction should not start until the patient has been warmed with active forced air warming. When preoperative hypothermia is identified, interventions should be undertaken to normalize their core temperature before surgery when possible. Pre-existing hypothermia is considered to be one of the most significant contributing factors to intraoperative hypothermia. And throughout the patient's surgical journey, all temperature measurements should be recorded at half-hourly intervals. The standard operating uh, the standard temperature range of a UK theatre is 18 to 20 or 18 to 22 degrees Celsius. The NICE guidance suggests that when a patient is being prepped, the room should be no less than 21 degrees, no matter how many air changes now, either in a standard plenum ventilated theatre or in a laminar flow or clean air theatre. All patients will lose heat in a theatre, and the NICE guideline recommends that all patients having surgery for more than 30 minutes are warmed. Surgeons and scrub personnel are particularly vulnerable to warm theatres because of the high level of stress during surgery and because they have to wear multiple layers of clothing, including gowns and possibly lead aprons. They may perspire into the surgical wound if the temperature is not regulated. Warm temperatures may also impair the team by decreasing their vigilance. It should be noted that not all theatres are on separate ventilation circuits so that in not every suite can one regulate individual theatre temperatures. The NICE guidance highlights the exposure that patients suffer when they first enter the OR, saying that this is an opportunity for further heat loss. They suggest patients should be kept covered until the last possible moment for skin prep, limiting time then for prepping and draping and exposure to the air. If forced air warming is being used, ensure that due consideration intraoperatively is given to using the maximum size of blanket necessary. US literature emphasizes that the hose from the forced air warming should always be attached to the blanket, as many burns have been reported where the hose has been used between the patient's bare skin and a sheet. NICE identifies that if intravenous fluids are being given to the patient interoperatively, 
but if the volumes are more likely to are likely to be more than 500 mils, the fluid should be warmed. This applies to blood as well. And a unit of refrigerated blood or a liter of crystalloid solution given at room temperature can impact the patient by decreasing their body temperature by a quarter of a degree in a 70 kilo patient. Do you know what temperature the solutions are that you give the surgeons or anaesthetists? How do you measure it? Do you measure it? By the hand dip test? Irrigation fluid should be at the right temperature. If cold fluid is used, heat is transferred from the patient's body to the solution, which increases their heat loss. Warming irrigation fluids to 37 degrees should always be used as an adjunct to decrease heat loss. In a laparoscopic surgical study, Patients who had warmed irrigation fluids had higher core body temperature than those who had ambient temperature fluids. Of course, the irrigation fluid temperature should always be checked, otherwise burns could occur. What's the correct temperature for irrigation fluid? Nice said it and blood products should be warmed to 37 degrees C. They also suggest that the fluid cabinet should be thermostatically controlled to 38 to 40 degrees C so that all fluids warmed within can be to 37 degrees by the time they are delivered to the patient. Do you know what the temperature of your warming cabinet is? How often is it checked? And how often is the temperature validated? I've also asked some further questions for you to reflect upon regarding local practice at your hospital or trust. If you cannot answer all of the questions, perhaps it's a good moment when this webinar is over to go and check them out. Are all your patients warm in your theatres? Is the temperature of the room for your benefit or for the patient? How long does it take for the temperature to change in your theatre once you've moved the dial? Is your warming cabinet effective? Do you measure and record the temperature? How often? What about the fluids coming from the cabinet? How hot are they? And how long have they been in the cabinet, either in or out? AORN standards and recommended practices also highlight irrigation fluid temperature warming to a 37 degrees centigrade. They also say that a sterile thermometer should be used to check fluid temperature before it's delivered to the patient. An irrigation warming bath has recently become available in the UK, which enables maintenance of a set temperature with a reading, so it can be continually monitored and reset as required. Reducing the risk of burns to patients from irrigation fluids needs some control measures to be implemented intraoperatively. A safe temperature for irrigation fluid is the goal. It maintains patient normothermia, reduces the opportunities for SSIs, reduces the risk of adverse clinical outcomes due to inadvertent hypothermia, and increases patient safety by reducing the risk of patient burns from hot solutions. Current technologies available for warming IV solutions, blood and irrigation fluids are a warming cabinet and other warming technology which heats the fluid as it passes through a tube inserted into the device, also known as inline warming. Other available alternatives are the open basin warming technology which maintains the fluid at a constant temperature that can be set and altered as required. A few facts you may not know about fluid warming cabinets. The cabinet should be separate for fluids and blankets, or at the very least be separate areas of the same cabinet, which may be able to be set at different temperatures. Blank Blanket warming cabinets should have a maximum setting of 54 degrees C and fluid warming cabinets limited to 43.3 degrees C. They should be routinely checked and the temperatures recorded. Now those recommendations come from the independent ECRI Institute 
which is uh, the Emergency Care Research Institute, a uh, not-for-profit organization that researches appropriate uh, approaches to improving patient care and safety. Some recommended practices which may or may not happen in your hospital. The suggestion that saline going into a fluid warming cabinet should eat to be labelled either with a use-by date or a date when they were first stored in the cabinet. Because irrigation fluid is considered medication and because the saline has a limited lifespan once placed in the warmer, the solution bottles must be labelled and rotated. And expiry dates are different for different solutions, so you need to individually check with a pharmacy um, to identify which is which and how long each can be kept in the warming cabinet. So the medication information leaflets come with the IV fluids and um, you can check exactly whether they can be warm and how long for. Patients can be harmed by some of the effects of not monitoring or not observing acutely. Saline from a warming cabinet which has been in the cabinet too long or may have been taken in and then uh, put in and then taken out again and then put back can change to a hypotonic tonic solution which affects osmosis in the cells. Cabinets where the temperature is not monitored or is raised for some time if the thermostat fails can melt the contents without any trouble. And patients have been caused severe burns by the use of a microwave oven to warm fluids for irrigation due to hot spots and lack of temperature movement once the fluid has been removed from the oven. You may be surprised by that, that microwaves are used for heating solutions, but that it's a true, they're true stories. It's also a surprising fact that cold fluid put into the warming cabinet can take between 8 and 10 hours to get to the correct temperature. It's perhaps surprising too that once removed from a warming cabinet, a bag of fluid cools down quite quickly. It's been found that a one litre bag warmed to 43 degrees C, if poured into a metal basin, cools to 37 degrees in just seven minutes. If the scrub or circulating practitioner has misjudged the time by a small amount, the patient will not get the fluid at the correct temperature. And the window then for timing is between 5 and 10 minutes. I mentioned this new device which has become available in the UK recently. It's called IntraTemp and is in wide use in the USA and now in an increasing number of trusts in the UK. A sterile insert is used to create a bowl liner and fluid is then poured into the bowl and the machine regulates the temperature, maintaining fluid at the temperature which you have set. This can be checked by the circulator at any time and the scrub nurse and the temperature of the fluid recorded in the perioperative record. The technology takes about 45 minutes to warm solutions from ambient temperature up to 38 degrees and will then maintain it for as long as is required. The NICE guidance specifies the monitoring of post-operative care in PACU or recovery. It recommends that temperature recordings are made every 15 minutes and it, that if the patient is cold, then additional blankets or forced air warming is used in recovery. They suggest that the patient should not be returned to the ward until their temperature has returned to more than 36 degrees. If the patient is shivering, then oxygen should be administered as the shivering causes additional demand for oxygen to the tissues. And once the patient has been discharged to the ward, monitoring should include their temperature and a recording made at least every four hours. Warming should be used if the, temp if the patient's temperature drops below 36 degrees. They can also be asked how warm they are feeling. And the next slide just shows you the main references which I used um, for
for the uh, webinar. That completes the delivered section of the webinar. Does anyone have any thoughts, comments, or questions? Thank you, Kate. Um, if anyone's got any questions, then um, you can just pop them into the, the chat box at the bottom of the screen whilst we're waiting for anyone to uh, think of any questions that I'd like to ask. Um, I've got a quick one, actually. Okay. Um, we were discussing before we, before we started, actually, about um, the key change not being just um, Obviously, this process, the imperative warming piece, covers a range of stakeholders, so not just the multidisciplinary team in the theatre, but also engaging with the team on the ward as well. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how to get them involved in the process of ensuring that patients are appropriately warm before they arrive and how to get them involved. I, I think that's um, about um, ensuring that multidisciplinary team meetings focus on areas of care that um, count for everybody and certainly patient warming um, is one of those important areas. It means to me that some practical solutions need to be found such as the ward staff understanding exactly where the uh, incision is going to be so that they can find the appropriate warming blanket um, that's uh, shared by theatres um, and um, that technology is used by the pre-admission ward or the surgical ward and that um, means that there will have to be many many more units within the hospital. It's not without its challenges that um, but it is crucial either that or we all ensure that that patients come to theatre a great deal earlier than they currently do and that space is found for them to be pre-warmed in theatre which has got a whole heap of other issues for theatres. So it's not simple, um, but it does need a multidisciplinary team solution, and it needs anaesthetic input, I'm absolutely sure of that, to ensure that we have the whole picture and that we have the whole journey as part of the solution for the patient. Okay. Great, thank you. And I was wondering as well, um, did you have any signposts in terms of further resources or places that you would direct people if they wanted to research more on the topic? Obviously, we pointed to the NICE guidelines and the AORN guidelines, and I know that there's a um, surgical pathway from the Royal College of Anesthetists as well that uh, goes into this topic. There is. There's also a very useful document which can be downloaded, um, which has been put out by the Peri Anesthesia Nurses Association of America. So um, that's uh, ASPAN. Um, and they've got some very uh, particularly focused on patient care and recovery solutions to uh, cold patients. Um, the new uh, guidelines from AFPP um, have got several pages of uh, uh, research uh, evidence. Um, and um, there are um, several real gurus. The, the one that sticks in my head particularly is an anaesthetist in the USA who is the global guru as far as patient warming is concerned and his name comes up in almost every um, piece of research. So if you uh, put um, Dr. Fessler, S-E-S-S-L-E-R, -S -S into Google Scholar, you will come up with thousands of hits. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's, he's a good guy to look for. Um, I can't see any questions from the floor, so um, in that case, uh, I will go ahead and close this uh, off because I think um, between the deliver portion and the, and the Q and A, that kind of brings us up to time. Um, so in that case, just uh, remains for me to say thanks to Kate for presenting and giving us that information. Lots of food for thought there. Um, thanks to you all for attending. As I say, the recording of this webinar will be made available, and we'll also uh, make it available for download as well, um, so it can be logged to your CPD. Um, if you have any questions or feedback, um, then you can contact us. There'll be uh, there'll be feedback. The ability to give us feedback via the uh, follow-up email that you get after attending. Um, and when you get the recording, you can feel free to share that amongst your colleagues as well. So thank you all very much, and uh, we'll be in touch soon regarding any further educational events and um, insights that we can offer. Um, if you want to stay up to date with those, you're already on our mailing list. But you can also follow us on Twitter at ECL Healthcare and um, or just get in touch with us generally and we can put you up to date. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks.
Bye. Thanks, everyone.